you have to build, I want to say like old school, do it like from yourself, build what you think your vision is, build what you think you want, and then integrate it. So then you can ask the AI, okay, well, what would you do now? What are the next steps? And see if the solutions are different than what you're coming up with, but you're using your framework as the base. And I think that if you use it as a supplement, as opposed to someone who's like a novice and they go into AI and they think, okay, I'm going to just do this. And this is going to tell me all the things that's not realistic, right? At least not at this point. But if you use it as more of like a checklist, a double check against what you're doing. That to me is how you can benefit from it. Welcome to Events Demystified Podcast, where we explore and demystify the world of in-person, virtual, hybrid event AV production and technology by sharing insightful tips, tricks and tactics to make your events a success. This podcast is brought to you by Tree Fan Events, a woman-owned boutique event production agency. And your host is Anka Trafan, a technical event planner and producer with almost two decades of hands-on technical experience in event production. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Events Demystify podcast, your one-stop shop for tangible, technical, and practical planning advice for anyone in the events industry. This podcast is sponsored and produced by Trifan Events, a woman-owned and operated boutique event production agency that provides planning strategy, production, technology, and the technical expertise to host successful virtual and hybrid events. And I am your host, Anka Platon Trifan. In this current season, our focus is on the fascinating world of AI and its practical applications in the events industry. We are delving deep into the various ways AI can be utilized for events while also examining the potential opportunities it presents and the risks that we need to be mindful of. Additionally, we are demystifying the significance of pre-event planning, why effective event management is crucial for the success of any event, and how strategic partnerships can enable Enable us to never turn down a new client. And for this specific topic, I have a wonderful guest today with me. My feature guest to cover the topic is no other than Erica Maurer, a powerhouse in the events, marketing, and hospitality industry, an A figure entrepreneur who had generated over a hundred million in events. Erica is a partner at EMRG Media, a leading events marketing production and creative agency. She She's a Tufts undergrad, Columbia graduate, a figure entrepreneur, as I just mentioned, and the founder of the Event Planner Expo. Talk about having a resume. She is also the producer and owner, as well as a coach and a speaker. And the type of events that EMRG Media produces are corporate, celebrities, type of events, brands, social nonprofits from the nonprofit sector. Notably, what was super exciting for me is to hear that she is the founder of the renowned Event Planner Expo that I mentioned, the leading trade show for the events, marketing, and hospitality industry. Without further ado, I am going to bring Erica in. Welcome to the show, Erica. I was sort of like thinking, oh gosh, I definitely messed up your last name. Uh, there you have it. So do correct me, please. If I didn't get it right, tell our audience, how do you pronounce your last name? You actually did it perfect. It's Erica. Oh. So you, you did it spot on. So thank you. Well, it's such a pleasure to have you on the air with me today. And I mean, your impressive resume speaks volume about the type of dedication that you have for the event industry and your success in the industry. So for our listeners to get a little bit of a better understanding of how you got where you are, would you give us just a short snapshot of your journey and what brought you where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think you touched upon it a little bit in the intro, but I went to grad school at Columbia. I thought I wanted to do business. I did a business degree and also to be a licensed therapist. So dealing with people. And then as I started to do that, I realized maybe that was not the right direction. 
So I obviously finished school because that's what I started. But as I was doing the grad program, I started to kind of like tip my toes into like fashion events and all different types of opportunities to kind of be hands on. A lot of the people that I had friends wise were in that industry. So they kind of opened up some doors and I started to do some stuff. And I realized that that was more of the direction I wanted to go in. So I dabbled in like nonprofit and donor relations and fundraising and doing a door at an event, doing like VIP guest list, like everything and anything that you could think that you should know and how to do for events. I started to do that. And that's kind of where I realized, wow, I think this is really more the direction. And slowly, I started to build my way towards launching an events company. It sounds a lot like my journey back in LA when I was working for different agencies, producing runaway shows and live concerts for A-listers. And it was super, super fun. But let me tell you, that comes with a price. And for me, that price was burned out. I'm super curious towards the end of the conversation. I want to touch on that a little bit because I don't know any event professional that gives it all without feeling the other side of the giving it all. So before we get to that part, though, I would love to hear from you as we dive into the nitty gritty of our topic, from your point of view, what would be the reason why, say, the pre-event planning is so important, especially in the context of this AI revolution? And think of the audience of like, this is the first time I've heard that we should do some pre-event planning for our events. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think that pre-event planning, especially when it comes to AI, is important because it's an interesting way of looking at it, right? It's getting some fast information. It's getting a different way of thinking about it. And sometimes it's just helpful because you can run ideas. You could say, what is the best way to produce a 500-person event? And maybe that answer that you're going to receive is different than how you naturally would think. So it opens up that opportunity. And so it makes you think broader than what your one-dimensional maybe thought process could be. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like in so many ways, it can be the starting point to even more creativity versus just doing the same old event the same way you might have or the team that you're part of might have done for years. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I do recall being part of a few events like that and thinking, wow, they did change the uplighting color this time. (laughs) So definitely things to keep in mind as you're looking into, you know, the next gala or the next, who knows, you know, runaway show that you're planning. Now, there's obviously a lot of thought and effort that goes into the process of event, pre-event planning before the event even begins, right? So Mm -hmm. let's shift gears for a little bit and talk about the event itself. How would you say event management or why would you say event management is critical to a successful event? In order to do a successful event, you need to really think about it as a, as a full picture, right? So you need to think about every single step. And in order to think about every single step, you need to understand the process. So you and I, we do events, right? So we're going to think critically different than our clients would because all they're thinking of is, I have a space, I need music, and everything else just kind of aligns. But it's not that. It's all those little pieces that puts together that big picture. And so when you're thinking about it from an event management perspective, you're looking at it as little pieces that make up the whole. And what are the things that are necessary to create that vision, right? To create that beautiful uplighting, to create the floral, to make that entertainment pop. It's not just showing up, just assuming that things are going to happen because there's a lot of micro pieces that puts it together. So now taking into the world of AI, I'm curious, could you share your thoughts on how AI can enhance even the event management part of the event, not just the pre-event planning? It's interesting because AI, you can ask the questions and say, what would happen if this occurs? And it's going to give you 10 or 20 different solutions, right? So when you're thinking of event management, when you're using AI, like I just did this the other day where we were launching a, a like a cocktail party. And I said, well, how do we think about this differently? What are we going to do? And we said, what are some cool names What are some exciting names to call this event? But we want this event to highlight food, views, high end, new hotel, all those things. And it shot out all these different phrases and all these different angles that we could use. And I never thought of it like that because my mind doesn't think in the same way that this computer is going to think. So I think it opens us up like across the board with saying you can expand the thought because you're not going to think necessarily the same way Mm -hmm. that this AI generation is going to. 
Yeah, I think it's definitely fascinating to hear more examples about the potential of AI and how it can certainly enhance the prevent planning and management. And there's also this element of being more efficient and more effective, right? That mm-hmm. AI brings to the table that, at least in my experience, it has definitely changed the game for me because I can do so much more knowing that I can have, like, just the example of preparing for the podcast, I would, I already, you know, pre-program ChatGPT, for example, to have this, I created this prompt, a smart prompt that would take all the information from the podcast intake form and automatically will fill it within my prompt and then generate a lot of the additional questions or transitions that I would have to sit down and write myself or think about it myself. And I do that because I love writing regardless, but it's like saves you so much time. So imagine in the context of an event, like having Having to potentially write scripting or create a new type of agenda that is just different than what you've done in the past. You can actually give it all the previous agendas as a intake information and then ask it to output something different. Like, how can we change this to make it a bit more creative? Now, in all of this, obviously, there's also this idea of how while AI is fantastic at automation and optimization for certain tasks, and obviously it can bring this astounding precision to some of the tasks that we do, it still lacks the ability to think independently, which is obviously a crucial human attribute. So the reality that presents the most challenges, particularly when incorporating AI in events, is this idea of keep using your creativity and your humanity to humanize AI, even in the places that you just want to delegate it. I just be like, okay, do your thing. So speaking of challenges, could you share maybe some of the things that you have perceived as being main hurdles in integrating AI into pre-event planning, management, execution of events? I think that the main thing is, is that, as you just said, the humanization is that it doesn't think like we would think. So when you're asking, okay, what can this agenda look like? I need to accomplish X, Y, and Z. There's going to just be pieces that'll be missing. But I think that in a way that might be a hurdle, but then you could use it in a positive way, right? You could take the pieces that AI gives you and the pieces that your team puts together and you integrate it. And all of a sudden you have a really comprehensive situation. So it just kind of will point out a couple of different pieces that I think that we would naturally look at. Do you have any practical examples of some of those challenges that you might have encountered in the field? Yeah. So we were, we were putting together this event run of show. We were doing all these details and we were asking some questions like, what do we need to start the event? What do we need for the entertainment? And it gave some thought, some aspects that like we weren't really thinking about, but then it didn't really factor in like, oh, you need to set up a stage or, oh, you need to set up, you know, do a, a sound check or lighting because it, it's not thinking like that. It's thinking yeah. of what do I need to get done? But as long as you take that as like a piece of the cog, like I always say to people, you can't just take chat GPT and think that you're going to write a letter or right. an invite or an agenda or things like that. You have to take it and then revise it in your own word and your own voice so that it's emulating what you wanted to say. So in this situation, how can event professionals then navigate some of those challenges, like aside from obviously bringing their humanity, their creativity, their experience, (laughs) and don't forget about all the experience that you learn hard lessons when you're in the field, when you work events, right? Like let's not put that on the side and just assume that AI is able to solve our problems because that's just not the case. But how do we take some of those challenges and then maximize the benefits of AI while also being mindful of some potential pitfalls. So I think is is you have to build, I want to say like old school, do it like from yourself, build what you think your vision is, build what you think you want, and then integrate it. So then you can ask the AI, okay, well, what would you do now? What are the next steps? And see if the solutions are different than what you're coming up with, but you're using your framework as the base. And I think that if you use it as a supplement, as opposed to someone who's like a novice and they go into AI and they think, okay, I'm going to just do this. And this is going to tell me all the things that's not realistic, right? At least not at this point. 
point, but if you use it as more of like a checklist, a double mm-hmm. check against what you're doing, that to me is how you can benefit from it. And obviously saving time, right? You can list off what you're thinking and it's going to shoot out 30 different answers. You just can't think that fast. And then you can like reassess what your direction is and then ask AI again, what is this question? You know, what do I need to do? What do I go to the next step? And then it starts to really hone in and it can help you also guide, you know, like building out something that maybe you couldn't see the full path. Absolutely. So basically, in so many words, just understanding the capabilities and the limitations of AI is really crucial to be able to take advantage of its potential and Mm -hmm. apply it in a way that makes sense for an event. Here's one of my concerns, though, as we all, you know, are obviously exploring this tool. Do you feel like there could be a danger where a lot of the events might look the same? Because AI is a learning language model, right? So a lot of event professionals, they're all going happy on it and inputting all this information. But then AI has a limitation as to, you know, what content has been shared with it prior to generating. Sometimes it comes up with its own content. We know that Mm -hmm. could be something that obviously needs to be fact-checked or it could be totally like, where did that come from? So do you feel like there could be a danger where a lot of the events, the events of the future might look all the same or sound the same or have the same content? Or it's like, how can we avoid that? I think the main way of avoiding it is making sure you don't lose like your own identity. People do business with people who they like and trust. They're not doing business with an AI auto-generated computer, right? But they're going to trust you as a person. So as long as we don't lose our humanization, as long as we don't lose our identity or what we're known for, our specialties, and we use it as a tool, right? An assistant. So it's kind of like when you have 10 people on your team, maybe you could use AI as like that 11th person, right? That extra help but it's not the cake, right? It's not the whole thing. It's a piece of it, you know? So it's like a little piece of that equation. And I think people who will be relying on it are going to fall short because it's going to not get you to the destination that you want to get to. It is a good resource, just like, you know, going to strategic partners or talking to other planners. Those are resources and you want to be able to use that in a piece. And I think as long as you're doing that, that's the way to make sure that you're not going to be the one of many, right? You don't want your event to look the same. You don't want to be giving the same solutions that everyone else is. You want to be unique. Absolutely. And I think probably most of our listeners are just noting along. Yes. (laughs) Let's not forget that the reason why we are not all the same and we are not having the same clients and we are not all serving the same audience is because we all bring something different to the table and something unique, or at least you hope so, right? So before we actually delve any deeper into this topic, we're going to take a short break and we're going to acknowledge our podcast sponsor and supporter. And then we're going to be right back to dive deeper into this topic. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right right back. Before we move any further, I wanted to give a quick shout out to our main sponsor, Trifan Events, which is a boutique event planning and production agency that will come alongside you, offering personalized event planning and technical support, strategic event design, production and technology management, and flawless execution for live, virtual, and hybrid events. The team at Trifan Events is passionate about planning and producing event experiences that get people involved with true moments of interaction, engagement, and co-creation while offering white glove treatment throughout the entire planning process, enabling you to reach your event goals with the use of creativity, production tools, and event technology. To find out how Trifun Events can plan and produce your event become memorable, go to trifunevents.com. Welcome back, friends. If you're just joining us, we have Erica Maurer, a partner at EMRG Media, powerhouse in the events marketing and hospitality industry who has generated over a hundred million in events. Now, Erica, in the context of AI and strategic partnerships, we just talked a little bit about partnerships. And I'm curious because, you know, we talked about how being unique and bringing something different to the table, it's important in order to for each one of us to keep that human factor into the event planning and event process. And that's, you know, so true for many event planners that are either afraid to embrace technology or are like going full throttle in and <laughs> using it in all things. Now, could you expand a little bit on how the right strategic partners, possibly even, you know, AI driven solution as a partner can enable this level of flexibility and adaptability in taking on new clients? 
So I think that strategic partners in itself are very critical for someone's business. And in order to grow to the level that anyone would like to, you need to have relationships, right? Now, AI can serve as a tool to provide some knowledge, meaning let's say I might say, so I'm doing an event for Google next week. And so I'm not a florist, right? But I have a strategic partner who is a florist. So in this situation, I could say to them, what are some cool designs? What would you recommend for a hundred people sitting and dining at tables? They will give me a solution, right? The AI would give me a solution, but I could take that and I can go back to the florist and I might say, Hey, I was thinking, what do you think about this? So it can give you some knowledge in the sense of having a conversation that maybe you're not strong at because that's not your area of expertise. But I think at the end of the day, strategic partners in real life, that's what I want to call them, are always going to far surpass anything that you're going to get from an AI in that regard. Absolutely. Now, because we were talking about the Event Planner Expo and we didn't really yet touch much on it, I would love to hear how that came about and how is it going now and how are you incorporating maybe some of the AI tools into planning this event that's actually coming up in October this year? So the Event Planner Expo was started 11 years ago. We had always been an events agency and a lot of our clients had said, we would really love an opportunity to be able to connect with people. We would love an opportunity to showcase what we do. We would love this opportunity of being educated. And how can you solve this problem? I don't know why they were asking us because at that time we didn't do this, but our team started to talk about it. And my partner said, you know, I think we can do something like that. And what we wanted to do was bring the community together. And like we talked about a second ago is form those strategic partners. And so that's kind of where the hub came. It was about just creating a community, about creating a place where you can come together and learn and educate and do new business, right? Because entrepreneurship can be lonely. Being an event planner, you could be a solo event planner, right? You don't Mm -hmm. necessarily have a team and it's hard to be able to be like one thing to everybody. And so Mm -hmm. the expo was kind of created as a solution to be able to bring that together. And then from there it grew, you know, we're going into 11 years this year, we have Gary Vaynerchuk speaking. So every year it kind of developed a little bit more. We do actually have a panel, which is going to be on tech and AI will be talked about. So we're always kind of trying to integrate like what things are now, what are the new things? And actually Gary is going to be talking about AI. He actually joined us in 2019 Mm -hmm. before the pandemic and talked about his social media and so forth. And he's coming back and he's going to be angling this angle. So Mm -hmm. That's how it's kind of built and it's kind of grown. And this year we'll have like over 3,000 attendees over the course of three days. That's fantastic. You know, what's something super interesting that I'm just about delving into and learning more about is the capacity that AI has as a unlearning tool where you can use it without, you know, affecting privacy to track event data and trace shows and metrics and analyze a lot of the data that comes through, you know, say, a tree show. Many times, you know, I feel like we do get data and we to look at it, but then we also want to alter it because we've got egos and we've got Mm -hmm. ROI that we need to prove. But AI has no ego, like it does not care about ROI. It's going to show you what is true and what happens in numbers, right? So that sounds very exciting. I was having a conversation recently with someone and the capacity to understand some of the things that are happening in the world is like, oh my gosh, my mind just is blown (laughs) out of proportions right now. Now, and I think there's a point there where we need to be aware how in order to understand how fast technology is moving in our day, we have to somewhat keep up with it and keep in step with it. So bringing the question back to you, how do you and your team stay up to date with the latest AI tools and all the implementations that come with that? And how would event professionals benefit from doing that just by sharing your experience? So what we've been doing is we've just been honestly going on and learning and taking classes and trying to understand, like, what's the functionality? Like, what can we use it for? You could use it for event posts on social media. You could do stuff with Facebook. You can write like bios. You can write descriptions. Like, how do you want to incorporate it? And then taking it back to the team and using it. It does save time, obviously. It doesn't always land with the voice that, like, let's say we want to say it or if you were trying to do it, like, in your voice. But I think it's a good framework. And as long as you're staying educated, right, take seminars, go on YouTube, look at those different aspects, like try to see what works for you, because 
the chat GPT is great, but you have to use the paid version, right? So you have to commit to doing that because if you do a free version, you get like a couple searches. So yeah. that's one way. And then kind of just making sure that you're personalizing it. Absolutely. Um, actually, I'm going to say something here on the voice because I feel like there's definitely some misconception there because a lot of people think that they cannot train chat GPT to sound like their voice, but there's a lot of tools out there and prompting mm -hmm. that you can use. I have actually tried to train an intern to write my newsletters in mm -hmm. my voice mm -hmm. and it took so much effort and I went through several only to be sort of like disappointed that okay you know what it has to be on me because I just can't get the right person to fill this role I'm obviously very picky when I write I write and it has to sound like me and then ChatGPT came along and I started giving it a lot of samples of content that I've created prior to this and I'm talking about mass amounts of text mass amounts of things that I wrote blogs and I'm in the middle of writing a book so there's a lot of things that I have written with my own hands and and I gave it all and I gave it the opportunity to learn what Anka sounds like. And mm -hmm. then I started prompting it to write content in my voice. And let me tell you, so far, none of the people that I tried to hire to do this job came anywhere close <laughs> Well, it's, it's to the type of results that I'm getting from ChatGPT once it's been trained to sound like me. Yes. Now, you're 100% right. And it takes someone to be able to supply that. So the question is really, as an event planner, as a professional, do you have that content to be able to like, so for example, like you have to make your own, in essence, ChatGPT like profile, right? Yep. And then you're going to do it and say how it's going to be. And this is what I wanted to say. And that yep. does take time. Obviously, if you have the ability to invest that time, which people do, right, and commit to making it, you can definitely train it. But yeah. if you think that you can go on it and just say, okay, help me today, that's not going to really work in your voice because ultimately it doesn't know you. So I love yeah, the exactly that because you have to build a profile and then the profile mm -hmm. knows who you are because you're the profile. Yeah. And you're right. Like it's based on content that you have written, but that's what I feel like the uniqueness comes to into play as well, because then my content is not going to sound like everybody else's content because it has to come from, obviously it still has to be, like I said, fact check. Don't just put everything out there. I see some posts on LinkedIn and I just cringe because I can tell <laughs> right from the bat that somebody just copy and pasted something and they're like, ah, this makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important to keep that intellectual factor and don't just like trust it for what it is. It's like, it's almost like a two-year-old that you're going to train to do a series of things like how to ride the bike, how to swim, how to, I don't know, like do all the things that kids do when they're small toddlers and how to eat properly, right? How to talk. You have to train it because it's a machine learning model. So obviously it's going to learn as you go, but if you just expect it to know you and sound like you and do the things that you wanted to do right off the bat, probably going to have some troubles with that. So as we move on with our conversation, how do you see AI tools enhancing the future of events as we see it today? Well, I think it would be good for like knowing like your data points that you referenced. So understanding like who's coming to your event, what is the demographic, what's the age range? Is it male? Is it female? What do they like? Do they do certain things at the event? Like, do they take the photos do they not take the photos, but they went and they did something else to a different activation? I think that that, if you can feed it the information, it's obviously smart enough to figure out and put together formulas. So if you're going to like use AI, it's about like taking the data points that you have compiled and then feeding it to them and saying, okay, show me who is my target? What were people more interested? Did they attend this session or did they attend another speaking session? Like what were those pieces? And then from there, you obviously have a lot of statistics that you can analyze. Absolutely. It's funny because I just learned about a AI model technology that is doing exactly that. It's called Fast Sensor. And it really, it's fantastic in the way it deploys and how fast it deploys and how it's not expensive, like it's not going to run you into the ground to just collect that type of information based on nine different criteria, right? To know exactly how can you improve this event based on real numbers for next year. Or if you have several activations, you can run A-B testing and say, okay, so that worked, that didn't work. Or you can create heat maps. We had heat maps in the past, but some of them, they weren't necessarily that 
accurate because it was trying to either generate content or take content from like maybe beacons or Bluetooth phone mm. being on. Many people don't have their Bluetooth on or downloading an app. How many people go to download an app just to be tracked? Like, no, thank you, right? The technology that is growing right now and it's going in the direction where it's so much easier to get that type of information without, again, impeding on privacy because there's such an important topic to discuss here and that is privacy. Like, we want to make sure that our privacy is protected. And in the U.S., actually, privacy is not as strictly protected as say in Europe. But like, for example, you have some European attendees to come to your event. Do you know that you have to be protecting them based on their laws, not based on our laws, right? Like a lot of event plans don't even consider like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, like they are protected by their laws. So you are infringing (laughs) on their privacy if you do these things, even if they're in US at your event, right? So there's a lot of things to be said about privacy concerns when it comes to AI. And it's important when we track this type of data that we are mindful of the pitfalls, not just the challenges, but also some of the risk involved with that. Could you share maybe any specific instances where you know for a fact that AI has made a significant difference in one of your events? And that could be for better or worse. <laughs> I think that from an AI perspective, like it's helped with some creativity in the context of like, okay, let's say we're doing, I don't know, one day we could be doing a bar bat mitzvah, right? We do that a lot. And you throw out some words and you throw out some ideas and it creates some concepts that maybe you wouldn't have thought about. So in that regard, it kind of brings you to places that I think further extends from what you're naturally thinking. So that's an interesting piece. But from like what it's done, I just think that it's allowed you to open up a little bit more. I don't think for me right now at the point of like where we're using it, I don't think it's like something that I could say, okay, I think that this will be life changing to this event, right? I think we're using it in, in microcosms. We're using it as like an expansion of when we have something and we want to say, do you have another solution to what we've created? And then mm-hmm. it'll fill in the gaps. I'm not using it, our team's not using it in the level of where. It's taking over everything at this point. Mm -hmm. I think I'm very, very curious to learn more about how this tool can be used, say, in the matchmaking of matching attendees to the type of registrations or the type of events they're looking to attend, or maybe matching attendees to different vendor suppliers, partners. I just came from a conference this last week, and it was a major conference with thousands of attendees. And I remember thinking about how hard it is to actually find the right people to meet with based on my needs and my preferences and Mm -hmm. how we're still trying to sort through so much information. And there's so many data sets that do not communicate with each other. And as much as we want AI to solve our problems, you know, there's still data that is just not communicating, not communicating. Exactly. It's like you could have registration data, you could have badging, or you could have website, or you could have a virtual hybrid in person. All of it is like in different or different platforms, not even talk about how you have tidbits of information on different platforms. But every time you go and join an event, it's like, why is it not copying over what I already like put in just, I don't know, five months ago when I joined this Mm -hmm. event last time. So it's like different things like that, that is like, oh, so frustrating. Why are we still dealing with this frustration right now and why can we make it better more uh, efficient more productive and also smarter so we, if i go to a conference say an industry conference and i know that i only have bandwidth to meet with those 10 people make those 10 people relevant for me that's where i'm curious to see where we're going and how fast we get there because at the end of the day time is one of our highest what's the word i'm using for I mean, time is more valuable than money because you can't. It is, exactly. But, but it's like, there's a word I was looking for and I'm like, I can't, it doesn't come. I have a blank, like it's totally like, anyway. So it's, like, it's time that I'm, I don't have, I can't replace, I can't just buy. I have to figure out a way how to be productive in that sense, right? So I'm exciting for any tool that might come out there that could put together all of the data sets that we're working with currently and just create that type of AI, true AI, smart matchmaking for our events. So that would be the day. 
<laughs> when I'm going to have a happy dance. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that would be a great problem to solve. And you might have just created something because there, there, it's not doing it yet, but it probably can if you really spend time on doing it. But that would be an actually great resource because it is hard to actually match at events. And it is hard to say to yourself, out of these 3,000, 2,000, 1,500 people, who do I want to talk to? Who, where are my commonalities? Exactly. Yeah. All right. So now that we are coming to time here and we're ready to come to a wrap up, I would like to shift gears just a little bit and go into well-being for event professionals. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, burnout can certainly be a cause of concern for many of us that work very long days and seasons in events. So that's definitely a topic that is going to stay top of our minds, regardless of what season we're in. And for the Events in Mystify podcast, we cover that last year, this year, in our previous season as well. But it's not going to go away. It's something that as busy event professionals, we have to keep it at the forefront of our planning. We are the biggest, bestest event we're ever going to plan. So if we fade away, there is no event. So I'm curious from your point of view, how do you incorporate exercise, healthy mental and physical fitness habits into your busy schedule? How do you maintain your mental and physical well-being considering how this event industry is very demanding? So I don't know if you know this, but event planners, the industry itself is considered one of the most stressful industries on the level of like doctors doing surgery. So I think from that perspective, there's never going to be a full balance. You know, a scale can never be, you know, it's it's always one way or the other. It's, it's going up and it's going down. So accepting the fact that you know that you're going to be a little bit out of balance is part of how you can de-stress. Because when you realize that something is happening or you have five events coming up, you can brace yourself for it, right? So you conceptually can say, okay, I know this week is going to be tough, but Monday, I'm going to decompress because I'm going to have gotten through that. Taking time, be it in the morning, what I do is I take it in the morning and at the end of the night to just like kind of take myself and think and kind of process in silence and give myself time to like read and write and make my notes. And then also like take a break, walk around the block. You don't have to go to the gym for two hours, right? You could say, take well, you do if you're Anka. <laughs> Well, if you can, you can, right? So, well, if you have goals that are outside of the purview of events, probably you will. <laughs> yes. But for the layperson who maybe can't balance that, like Unk again, you know, doing those breaks, incorporating that yeah. is going to de stress you, right? Like just giving yeah. yourself that time and going to the gym in the morning or whether you're going to the gym at night, whatever that looks like for you, just I always say, from like a coaching perspective, like I always say to our students and I, we coach, you know, women specifically entrepreneurs that are in the events industry yeah. is you can't give a hundred percent to someone else if you're not giving yourself a hundred percent. Exactly. And so you have to decide where that balance is, right? And forgive yourself if you skip one day, which I know sometimes can be hard or forgive yourself if you say today, I just can't do it. You know what I'm saying? Because showing up for yourself is going to allow you to show up more for your clients and it's like a reciprocal cycle. Yeah. So basically, boundaries are important. Saying no to the right things. Somebody was saying, and I really like that, no is a full sentence. <laughs> I had a hard time with that. Okay. Like sometimes I guess I feel like I have to give all these explanations of, as to why I'm saying no. But really, at the end of the day, no is a full sentence. And then well, it's a no and then a period, right? And then it becomes a full sentence. <laughs> right. And then journaling. You know what I actually talking about AI, bringing AI into the well-being of events. I just discovered a new journaling app. It's called Rosebud. And every morning, you know, I would do my journaling like I normally would, you know, write in a notebook or something. And this is an app that, you know, you can write your thoughts, but then it gives you prompting. And then the mm -hmm. more you interact with it, the more it learns about you and mm -hmm. it starts prompting you on the things that you're setting a pattern for, right? So mm -hmm. then you can also set reminders for yourself or you can set maybe specific tasks to be following through. If you, you know, you're struggling with something, you're like, hey, I want to go to the gym every single day, but I'm struggling mm -hmm. with actually getting the motivation to do it. And mm -hmm. then it gives you prompts or it dissects the reason why you might struggle with trying to to 
unpack like what is mm-hmm. it that's stopping you right like I, I remember like just journaling one of the other mornings and I'm like I have a hard time like being present when I'm with my kids because when my mind I'm constantly like running my to-do list like I'm constantly mm-hmm. thinking okay I gotta do this 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 is this like yeah I do want to play with Legos but it's mm-hmm. like five minutes feels like forever <laughs> right so it's like w- what can I do to you know be more present obviously putting your devices down is could be one easy <laughs> way to do that but it was just so interesting to see how it would give me the prompting, but also to dive deeper into what I'm mm-hmm. talking about, but also give me some suggestions based on some of the things that I share. And I'm like, man, this is like my therapist. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to tell you. It's basically like sitting down on a couch and talking to a therapist. Exactly. Like, exactly what it is. So anyway, it was very, it's fascinating. So I'm still learning how to make the best of that session in the morning with my journaling therapist. I still have a therapist, a real one that actually is a human being that I talk to just for the record. For everyone that thinks that AI is going to place therapists, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But now that we're coming to an end here, Erica, could you please share with our audience who they can connect with you if they want to learn more about the things that you shared, also about the event plan. Planner Expo, give a little bit more information about that. Also, Erica has, I think, a 30% off any ticket if you're planning to join it. So give us a little bit more information on that. Yeah, so if you're interested in finding out more about the Event Planner Expo, you can just go to the eventplannerexpo.com and it'll give a very big overview about all the different pieces of it. If you want to follow us and connect with us online, you can go to at the Event Planner Expo and that'll be our Instagram account. Um, and then just like, as you were saying, Anka, like any of the listeners, if you're interested and you want to come into New York City and you want to take a couple of days and really learn, get immersed into like what this industry is about, forge new relationships and actually get ready to be inspired because we have over 150 amazing exhibitors and meet some amazing people. You can go to the Event Planner Expo and we're sharing a code it's called Gary, and it allows you to have 30% off on any ticket type from a general mission to the highest level. And that's compliments because of our session today. Awesome. So for anyone that's just listening, Gary is as in G-A-R-Y, just like in the keynote speaker. Yes. So Gary, as for Gary Vaynerchuk, his first name, you can go and you can use it and you'll save on any ticket type. Fantastic. All right. Well, this was great. Thank you so much, Erica, for joining me and for sharing your knowledge and your experience with events, with AI, with the Event Planner Expo and all the amazing things that you're working on. And for our audience, well, thank you for staying with us all the way till the end. If you are curious to stay tuned for more insightful information, please do subscribe and you will stay updated with what's coming up next. Until then, keep innovating, keep crafting unforgettable event experiences that leave a lasting legacy and keep staying eventful. And with that, this is Anka Trifan signing off. See you all in the next episode. Bye, Erika. Bye. Thank you, Anka. Thank you for listening to the Events Demystified podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment to review it, rate it, and share it with other event professionals that could benefit from it. Connect with us on social at Events Demystified Podcast. We would love to hear from you and what you're up to. If you'd like to learn more about free fan event services and find out if we're a good fit in supporting your event, can we help your event be successful with a 20-minute free consultation? Link in the episode's notes. Thanks for tuning in.